Hey, this is Rob Old Guy Tech TV, and this is news for Wednesday, February 6, 2013. I no longer can hear you. Oh, well, you should be able to hear me now. Okay. <laughs> you didn't get our fancy, you didn't get to see our fancy opening graphics, John, so it was, uh, it cuts out the audio why it does that. But anyway, thank you, everybody who's watching us. Uh, hopefully, you're going to have some fun with our discussion today, and this will be our weekly Wednesday show talking about different headlines. Uh, for the broad appeal, most of it at this time, at least this meeting is not going to be local, will be internationally uh, effective, and we've got many topics. And so I am going to start out. I want to introduce my partner in crime right behind me, John Matajastic. And yes, I am. Oh, that, a parrot on your shoulder, Bob. There he is. He's oh, like a parrot. He's right there on my shoulder. <laughs> so it's working really good. But uh, hey, I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Hopefully, we can make this something that's popular and everybody enjoys. Uh, it's always difficult trying to find the exact media to get uh, people interested, but we're going to give it a try. And what the heck, we're, we're, we're different than the rest of the alphabet soup news stories out there. Uh, so I'm going to start with one of the big uh, controversies that's going on right now are uh, women in combat. And um, all the branches, all the military branches still have, what's that, John? Your mother wears army boots. That's right. An insult from a long time ago. long time ago. So all the military branches still have different standards for females and, uh, than males. And why? because most women wouldn't even qualify to be in the military if they didn't have separate standards. Men and women are different, but those pushing women in combat don't want to admit the truth. This is to say nothing of unit cohesion, which is imperative, especially in combat fields when preparing to battle for the last, uh, and the last thing on your mind should be sex. But you put men and women in close quarters together, the human nature is what it is, and it doesn't matter what the rules are. The Navy proved that when they started allowing women on ships. What happened? They were having sex and getting pregnant and many times derailing an operation because they had to change course to get them off a ship. It is my understanding that once females get pregnant, they must be sent home. What a waste of training not to mention taxpayers' money. There is certainly a lot of work for women to do in the military, but all the problems that come with men and women working together are compounded in the war zone, destroying the cohesion necessary to fight bloody, hellish war. We are at war, and if we want to win, the top priority should be military readiness and winning wars, not political correctness, and artificially imposed equality in the military. John, that say I. What say you? Well, you know, I'm 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 a very much an egalitarian when it comes to all things, and uh, since women have taken a, a been actually in combat uh, over the last ten years. But not, and you know, uh, I, I apologize. I, the uh, the congressman that was elected, in, I do believe Wisconsin, and it's a double amputee. Um, women are putting themselves on the front line as it is anyway. And I think uh, back to our history that from the late '60s on, with the liberation movement in in America for women. Um, They've, there are women that want to take that position. And uh, if they have already been there, which we have strong evidence that they have been, they have been, we need to recognize them and let them go into combat and rise to the level uh, that they can rise in the military. Uh, many women are, are career uh, soldiers. Now, the fact of the matter is that they, they, they are integral. They have the womb. They carry the children, and that's a choice that, the, that a woman has to make. So I'm all for it, um, but the issue of being a mother uh, and a soldier does become an issue. I have heard um, from many soldiers in, in the field. Um, what happens is um, many of us become either lovers or brothers to the other soldiers in, in their unit. And... What can happen is it can taint the thinking of, a, of a how an operation goes down. What are you going to do when uh, your lover that's in your unit is captured, and how are you going to react, and are you going to be able to keep your brain on straight and be able to do what needs to be done 
uh, versus just being another another guy in the operation. I think mixing the two together can be a, a real problem in many units. And I've heard that some act, from some active duty soldiers saying that there have been these problems. And, and yes, you know, I think women can do just about everything. The one thing they don't do, though, is if you need to be firemen carried out in a war zone because you're shot up, uh, I don't think this woman's going to be able to carry another 100 plus pounds of, of gear and get you out of, a, out of the zone. So I'm not sure, even though they're equal, Let's face it, physically, they're not as strong. Uh, physically, that is true. And, and in some cases, that's not true. Uh, in some cases, they're equally as strong. Um, well, I'm not going to talk about things is, like pain and their tolerance for giving birth and, and that. And that no. I, I give them that, I John. There, I think, but, but I, I, I seeing a, a cross-section of people um, at a high school. There are some women that I could tell you, uh, you know, could drop... Um, many of the, the boys at high school, you know, I, how that goes in, in maturity. But one of the things that you touched on is, and, you know, we've seen John Wayne movies where we've, uh, there's bromance and there's romance, okay? People develop very close friendships in combat and, and buddies and dependencies, etc. But it's not like an emotional romance between a man and a woman. Um, you know, the issues now that they're bringing up of, of, of female Marines uh, that were basically sexually accosted as soon as they were transferred into some units. Can you do something about sex? No, you can't. And uh, the fact of the matter is the male libido, you know, is pretty much consumed with sex. Uh, and and it, that age issue, group, in that age group in particular, their, their testosterone levels are as high as they'll ever be in the rest of their life. Oh yeah, 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 and the women and and and, and the woman's is not. I mean, she could go eighteen to thirty-five, and I'd not be indifferent, but she's not as driven. I mean, you know, that's been one of the issues on a sexual level between men and women that we hit our sexual peaks at completely different times in our lives. Right. Um, are they capable of being good soldiers? I think they're capable of being good soldiers. I think part of what is happening here is that the fact of the matter is that in other militaries, uh, in particular, I, 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 I go to Israel, women serve front lines, women are, when they're in the service, they have, can be assigned to, can be anything in the Israeli military, uh, which I think was a strong marker for us saying, well, it's, it's possible. I, I don't think there, there there weren't other examples, uh, and I think in other countries, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, sure. everybody does military service. Right. Service, man, right. woman, but, um, a, but at different make levels. Any and and you got to remember, I'm talking again about combat. Yeah, we have women that are at checkpoints. We obviously ha we're putting women in in harm's way, uh, driving trucks in convoys, but I'm talking about the ground pounding grunts situation. Is that where a woman should be um you know i i again i go to the fact of the matter that you that on this one and in israel yes they're ground pounding grunts they can, can be on the front line they've been actively involved in combat and it has been like that for a very long time um that's the one you know that's the one particular example that i that i can bring up um I, it, bottom line, and I think this is has got something to do with it. Um, it's up to the woman if she feels she's capable, and she's going to have to. You know, there were questions as to whether she could be a green beret or she could be a seal. Uh, you know, which is extremely demanding, and physicality definitely becomes an issue at that point. Right. Also, part of the reason I think why why you have to say this, and let me open the Pandora's box is that we have a LGBT equal equality in the armed forces as it is anyway. Uh, and you do have, I think that, I, I think that is part of the non-verbalized issue. The LGBT issue is the civil rights issue of this millennium. Uh, and if, if it's no longer, a, and let me just point out that, that, that Harry, Tru Harry Truman integrated the armed forces after World War II. Right. 
And one of the things that's significant about that is it, it, it kicked off Earl Warren, it kicked off the civil rights movement for African Americans, not so much Hispanic Americans, although they had an equal standing at that point. But they were not discriminated in the military. There were 600,000 uh, Hispanic Americans in the service that were not discriminated against. But the military is the only portion of the American population that can be ordered to do something. Uh, so Truman ordered that the military be integrated, and we have ordered that the military be further integrated with LGBT. Um, I think um, that is somewhere in the background here. The, the LGBT <clears throat> issue is a driver of women in combat. Sure, sure. Well, okay, so then the the other question, of course, and we didn't bring this up as far as women goes, but we're, we're also talking about uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, being abolished and gays serving openly in the military. Um, I don't have a problem with that uh, because they're basically going to have the same physical strength to go into the combat areas, you know, so I don't have an issue with that. And I don't really have an issue with, you know, with the women serving in combat areas either other than the fact that we, we need to understand that there's a physical difference and they're going to be less capable in certain areas and not let this throw them in harm's way. There's my problem. Are we going to, you know, it's fine and dandy to tell them and say, hey, you know, we're, we're, uh, we want you to be part of it. You can come and fight with us. But you know what? If we're putting them in a position uh, of harm uh, just to prove that they're equal, then I think we have a problem. I think, but I don't think that would happen much. And you do have the situation, you know, of a guy, well, and, uh, you know, we, again, here's the quagmire when you open the box is, uh, a guy could be, uh, and, and will these standards, you know, if you're five foot tall and weigh 105 pounds, you may not get into the military. And Correct. This is a ball and, and the standards of, of uh, uh, for military, uh, 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 you know, uh, 4F, not 4F, it's kind of a sliding scale. One of our classmates and longtime friends, Bob Braley, uh, you know, just retired from the military, and Bob's not a big guy. Right. Uh, his MOS was not here. Go have a gun, or we're going to make you a seal, or you're going to go. You know, the big red one, or you're going to be a green beret. They they do have physical requirements for certain certain military occupations, uh, and if a woman can't meet the standard, then she's not going to be able to do that job. I mean, it's flat. If you can't you hack it, I mean, you know, how many guys, how many guys wash out of a out of a special forces sure. Uh, sure. program in the army? Uh, and SEALs. It's uh, the elite and of guys the elite, that, right? You know, would drop you like a heart attack. Sure, right. Uh, you know, mean men, but it's it's they they make sure that that the testing and the training is so rigorous that only the best of the best of the best of the best right. will make right. it to that level. Um, but there, again, I, I, I hopefully, and I am not an expert on this, we, it will cause some reexamination of the military. And, uh, I, I oftentimes uh, have said to my students, I, I constantly say, look, guys, you turn 18, you have to register with, with selective service. Uh, and I think the big test for this is that if we come into a situation of conscri conscription, at any point, right. will women be eligible for the draft equally as men? Well, that has been bannered around uh, a lot. It goes back to our period of time with the Vietnam War, where you know the talk was, okay, if you don't want to serve in the military, let's have you serve in some form or another uh, in behalf of the country. And uh, I don't think well, that's... we did that in World War II. Well, yeah, and, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad person. thing. Uh, it may be a good thing. Uh, they might give a lot of young people a direction. You know, even if it isn't a military arm, maybe to be a uh, building arm or whatever it may be. It may give them another skill set that they haven't even thought of. Oh, and, and, and I'm actually, you know, going to bridge a little bit here to something that we have on the agenda for this evening. And, and, and that is um, uh, it, 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 that I, I must, and I, I have said this to students, 
I'm a strong believer that we need to have a DREAM Act, not just for immigrant children that did not come here on their own, you know, in an early age. We need a DREAM Act for all kids in high school. We, as you well know, when we graduated from high school, it was imminent. You could go to Vietnam. Right. You could go to college. Uh, and, and those were there. There was a trigger at that point. Whereas if you decided not to go to university and you had a high number in the draft lottery, the odds were you're going to the military. It didn't always mean Vietnam, but it could. Um, and so I will just tell you from my point of view, we need to have some trigger options, I think, for kids of high school age uh, that give them a direction rather than, you know, going home and living with your parents until you're 38. Yeah. Um, and it, it, with a trade school, uh, college, you, some developmental program that gives them an, a, a path to follow and, and some options, uh, because I have to admit that high school doesn't do a very good job of training people. And you know that there were guys and, and, uh, 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 that coming out of high school, the military service, the military option was a very good path sure. for them to take. Right. Right. And they it still training, is for many they people. Yeah. Get away from home. They, they, you know, it was join the service, become a man yeah. or get drafted. Become a man. Yeah, depending on your father fell at that time too hey you know i really be hoping to get some of the audience to join in here our studio phone number is 530-621-1210 and that's 621-1210 we haven't had anybody jump on this issue yet which surprises me i expected with a number of the vet friends that i have that they were going to jump in but they haven't done that so we're going to go to item number two and that's immigration and i'll step off here by saying that um we need to recognize that illegal aliens do not have the rights and privileges of American citizens. With the current exception of illegal alien children born in the United States, they are all lawbreakers and many are taking advantage of services provided to citizens, making them not much different than common thieves. They are owed nothing and should not be treated differently than any other criminal that is taking things that do not belong to them. The fact that most come to the United States illegally for economic reasons does not change the fact that they violated the sovereignty of the United States and jumped ahead of all the millions who are following our immigration laws. Americans play by the rules. Few of us would tolerate a line jumper if we were waiting in a queue to buy a concert ticket, so why should we be allowed for illegal aliens? Okay, John, up to you. A, up yours. Uh, <laughs> You know, you know how I feel about that, and it's very clear. It is they are coming here for economic reasons, and the the, 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 the bottom line, although this is 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 been there, there have been differences here. Somebody is giving them a job, and somebody is paying for them. Uh, you know, the issue, the issues of unions, the issues of, you know, wages, benefits, uh, in our current uh, economy, uh, everybody's getting the squeeze. Uh, if you're working for a company, your benefit, you're having to pay for your benefits, not pay for your benefits. Uh, you know, in my situation, there are people, my, my peers, that are going Medicaid, Medi-Cal, right? Because uh, they, they can't make enough money, nor can they find a job that has benefits. But the bottom line issue, the way I see it, is somebody, and it's usually not another immigrant, is giving them a job and providing them with money. Uh, which is why they're coming here better than that what they would make and you know let's use the the, the largest fact uh, in Mexico and you know you see uh, Western Union you know they make uh, even Bank of America has a way to send money to Mexico so we have a problem you know at, at low cost easily etc we have an issue here where we have an immigrant working population that is not subject to uh, you know, they're not Cal OSHA, they're not getting workers' compensation paid for them, all putting a stress on our system domestically. But at the same time, I've got to say, um, somebody's paying them to be here. Uh, and, it, and again, I don't think it's that the immigrants are paying them. I think American citizens are paying them and taking advantage of uh, the fact that they can they can work overtime without being being paid overtime wages, 
that they're not paying workers' compensation for them, they are considerably cheaper. Uh, and cheap labor, uh, being a student of economics, is always makes no difference who you are. I mean, you could be the most liberal at the end of the day when you when you when you add up the books, labor is a huge expense and if you can do it for less. Well, sure. How many of less. these stars have illegal alien housekeepers? As we've been finding Romney, out, for right? For God's sakes, I'm running for president. You yeah. can't have I can't have illegals yeah. cutting my lawn. No, or, I mean, or washing my clothes or watching my children or whatever it may be. Uh, and there is an industry, as, as just as there are coyotes that will bring them across the border. <clears throat> uh, these are not unintelligent people. These are not uh, not not entrepreneurs. So you've got people that uh, I mean, in, in the old uh, uh, agricultural worker thing, you've got you know people form companies. Uh, not and and it not every. There is a demand that has been created in a sub economy. I will tell you that living in Bakersfield in the San Joaquin Valley and having a friend who was an immigration attorney and for many years observing that was going on, there were people that would come in and they, they pago los taxes, you know, they want to pay their tax, they want to do everything. There are 11 million illegals in the United States and California not having, as you would think, having all of them. They are well spread across the country at this point. Um, and you you have issues that and there are business issues you know the issue of California will in, ensure an undocumented if they can get some form of a license in the state of California the uh, DMV is on the verge of and I think already is issuing what licenses to people that are not documented right why because they drive the propensity of an unlicensed driver being involved in an accident or even a fatal accident is much higher because the standards, the test, the driving test, the that we hold people to, that you have to, you know, show an ability to do to satisfy these requirements to drive, um, they don't know them. They don't know the law. They the stop sign, the whatever. Uh, so ignorance is not bliss, nor is it innocence. The other thing is if they don't have a driver's license, they can't be insured. And the uninsured motorist is costing us all money because if we, you know, and they do get involved in accidents for the reasons I, I described, you, they need to be in the pool. Oh. Uh, they need to be eligible for insurance, and to be eligible for insurance, they must be licensed. Well, let's, let's, let, let, let's make sure that they get their Obamacare. Uh, let's make sure no, that no, they no, get no, their no, driver's no, no, license. No, no. Wait, wait let's minute, make Rob. sure you that they get a, 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 a uh, giant leap. <laughs> no, you, a yeah, giant okay. I went from driver's license to, to medical care, care, but it's the same thing. And let's there is give... no evidence. There is no evidence. There are absolute restrictions and 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 fences built into the the uh, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, that say that we will not insure these people. I'm talking about the fact, and... Hey, we've uh, got to insure them, John, because all they do is show up at the emergency room, and we do not turn anybody away from the emergency room. Well, yes and no. I've had some experience with that, and yes, they do go to the emergency room. But there are also Anglos. There are also citizens that yeah, don't make very much money that go to the emergency I, room. I, I understand and, that, but the con the, and, what we're and, talking about right now I, are people I, that yeah, are in the country no, illegally. I will tell you that, that Romney offered that as a health care choice. They can always go to the emergency room, which puts our health premiums out, through the roof. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it was the issue of the mandate. Uh, if you want to go to Obamacare, same thing in California with, with the driver's license and automobile insurance. It's costing us money by not having them pay into the pool. True. Uh, many, many, many illegals that I have met and because of where I live and associations I have I've been exposed to these people they very much want to participate there are some that want to get on the dole of the you know the happy society that L LBJ created in the middle uh, 60s um, that basically offered you know all of these benefits here come on we'll take care of you uh, which have been used and both abused 
Uh, but the issue being that there are 11 million of these people in this country. And can you round them up and send them back to wherever they came from? And we'll also tell you that there are many that get, you know, there are there are Brits, there are Canadians, there are Australians, there are Yeah, but the numbers are small, that, and most of those people wait in line and get their turn. And this is the point. What part of illegal... Oh, a lot of, they're, they're, the, they don't make up the majority of the 11 million, but they're, they're, their numbers are greater than you think. Uh, okay, fine. Then it, it applies across the board. I'm, I am not picking just on Hispanics. I, I'm stating that all illegals who jump the line to come into this country illegally, what part of illegal don't you understand? Uh, that's not the, that, and that's not the issue I'm talking about. The fact of it is, is that, you know, and I, I could give you examples where people that you quote unquote assume to be legal uh, in one particular case many years ago here in Bakersfield, uh, a gentleman that had risen to a very prominent position in his Spanish language radio in Bakersfield uh, comes up to our mutual friend and goes where, where he was doing a radio sta uh, radio show and he goes, I'm illegal. <laughs> well, he's got five daughters and three sons, all very functional, uh, tax-paying American citizens, well-educated, etc. He's got a job where he's making a very nice amount of money. Uh, he's done well for himself in a, you know, a vacuum kind of a deal. And, you know, he's been in the country for 35 years, and he's illegal. Uh, and this is part of, this is a, actually a major portion of the immigration question. These people are very much assimilated into our society. These are not the, the, the quote-unquote wetbacks running across the border uh, in Arizona and California. These are people that have been here for a very, very long time. Uh, I, I will, you know, and I've shared with you off camera, I, I teach in the San Joaquin Valley. I teach in schools. I teach in, in, in parts of the valley that are, you know, 80, 85% Hispanic. And I say to my students, I'm second generation American. And they look at me like, what? You're a white guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but some of them are five and six generations in the United States. I mean... Well, here, here, here's my problem, John. I don't know about you, but when my grandparents came out over here, the first thing they learned to do was speak English. They came over legally, okay? They got, they got themselves jobs, they learned the language, and they assimilated into the society. That's not happening here. You know, how many, how many languages do we have our ballot printed in now? Oh, I know. But okay. It's, it, 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 you know, it's... it's, it's uh, God, it, uh, Chris Matthews says, I said one night, I, I, I think my great grandfather came here legally. <laughs> um, and immigration, you know, we had quotas, we had all kinds of things, but we are a nation of immigrants. Uh, you know, I'm second generation on, on two so sides. Am I. I don't know. Yeah, so you know, uh, and yes, uh, my, my, they, they came over, and I mean, they worked. They, they, there was nothing they wanted more in life than to become an American. And they would do whatever it took to become an American. Now, you also have to realize, mainly in the Midwest, but in many parts of the United States, school textbooks were in German until World War I, and Germany became our enemy. And then people said, eh, maybe we should change that. So there were, you know, again, you, you, and that's one of the reasons I love being a historian, is that you've got to look at things and, you know, dive as far back into the archive as you can find and see how we have been dealing with it. This is not a current problem. I, I no. was in a, in a senior it, seminar class and somebody, uh, one, of the, one of the girls had done a PowerPoint about Braceros. She had the PowerPoint up and it was like a dry run deal. And the word Bracero, she had put in lower case and it was misspelled. Hmm. And I pointed out to her the reason why it's misspelled is it's a proper noun. It was a word created by the Department of the, of, of the Interior because we had a Bracero program to bring Mexican workers. This actually started in World War II to bring Mexicans into California on a work permit to pick 
the crops uh, and it continued into and it really wasn't an issue until you get to uh, to get to Cesar Chavez and and uh, uh, in Delano and the grape issue and then the rights and, and treatment of farm workers became an issue and you have the UFW and it goes on from there but it was a legal uh, foreign worker program to do these jobs sure, sure. Um, and the bottom of you know we it, it, it was the same issue for African Americans uh, we always had a subclass, and part of what was discussed today, uh, and and the the Republican side of Congress was going, well, but do they really need to become citizens? So the question is, in this great United States, do we have a subclass of citizens and non-citizens? And we, I don't know. We well, I, yeah, I and, and I, I agree with you. About... They, we probably do have some of that, but I, I'm I'm going to go throw it right on back to the beginning. Saying here is that we have a process in place in this country already for people to come over legally, student visas, work visas, whatever it may be. They that have the actually ability... was was turned back a little bit, and if you know, Obama has deported two million illegal immigrants. Uh, in his first four years, which is more than any current sitting president in a long time. It, because it's more of a problem now than it ever has been. It's two million because no, no, he's no, no, got, no, no, he's, no, no. no, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> yeah. 18, 1849, the Chinese poured into California. Again, a marker in California. The 1892 Chinese Exclusion Act excluded China, China from anybody from China coming into the United States, in particular California, Japan just said, "Okay, we won't send anybody." We and as you know, because you've bought property, in the tenants on these old deeds of trust, you cannot sell this property to a Mexican. You cannot sell this property to Afri an African American. You cannot sell this property to an Asian, uh, especially up where you are. And by it, and, and the Chinaman's chance in hell. Is a phrase from California because they all came to prospect for gold, right? And everybody thought and they railroad. would be able to prospect for gold. Yeah, well, by golden 18, railroad. By 1850, <laughs> there was a fifty dollar a month tax on anybody that wasn't an American citizen that was prospecting for gold. Hey, maybe you should try that so, again. <laughs> oh, I, well, but that Let's is put the a tax on. The, Let's get them to pay the taxes, right? Is, the current idea that has been floated is they have to pay a fine. Yeah. They have to pay back taxes. They have to go to the back of the line with, you know, the considerations for the current immigration um, uh, law pending. And I'm down with all of that. Well, uh, because I, what a boom. My problem is, I understand what you're saying. My problem still is there will already show a propensity for wanting to break the law because they've already, think, they've think, already come in here I, illegally. I think, I think you're very wrong about that. I think they're propensity for propensity to be criminals uh, is it, the, the criminality of it is they're trying to make a living the problem is that Mexico who's gotten very industrialized doesn't pay their people any money yeah. they do have universal health care I know people that have worked an entire career in the United States on a green card that when they retire return to Mexico because they they feel they have a better health care program than they do in the United States well, good for so them. they go back yeah but, well that's fine. Um, that's fine but I, I think the, the criminality, they know they're, they're coming over illegally. But, you know, the difference is making $10 a day and making not, $10 a day U.S. as opposed to making, you know, let's say $8 an hour cash in the United States. And I, again, resonate. If no one was paying them, there is an incentive, incentive, there is incentive for their criminality. Somebody is paying them. If they weren't getting paid, they they're, wouldn't come here. They're either in fact in stealing it. In 2008 and 2011, one million illegal immigrants returned to their country of origin. Right. Because we didn't have any jobs. There were no jobs here, and and people and weren't good. paying them. Now. And they had to leave. Now, what they should do is get back in line, put in their paperwork, and wait their time, and then they can come over legally. They don't have to worry about any of the crap. No, employers need to fill out the I-9. Employers need to 
make sure it's all cash deals hiring. you know that They're, you're going yeah, in the crops the up and down the valley and and these people are not being paid by a check written by anything other than greenbacks well there are no there are labor contractors but yes they are receiving in-hand cash and that's where i find the positive parts of, of the proposed legislation is that if you're here okay you have a job and you'd be surprised uh, how many are, you know, are, are ranch foremen. They, they've been around a long time and they've gained a skill that's necessary. Um, but the thing of it is, if you're going to let them in, they have to pay a fine right. for being illegal. They have to pay the back taxes. Uh, and the boon to our economy to bring in 11 million people, well, it's not, uh, not all 11 million would be paying taxes, but a a significant millions of people that have not been contributing to the to our our our, our tax system. Uh, to so how far back are they going? What 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 is tax. if we're putting in this forward and then there's some kind of legislation that you're saying is out there when you say back taxes? How far are they going? If they've been uh, here 20 I years, the, maybe. And, and I know under the previous amnesty, it went back to your date of entry. Hmm. Okay. Well, good good, uh, good luck collecting that. that. Well, but th th you have to find some reasonable parameter. But you know, I don't know. I, I, if ten years, I mean, it, uh, this is these are the details that have to be worked out. But the concept, uh, the bipartisan concept of those that came out, and you have to remember that McCain and Kennedy had an immigration bill that they couldn't get through during the Bush administration that W wanted passed. Right. All right. Well, we, you know, uh, I, the, 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 we agree it, that something has it, to be done. It's just and, what? And you have to remember that the amnesty bill was passed under, well, oops, you still with me? I'm here. Was was passed by Ronald Reagan. Right. It wasn't, you know, a liberal Democrat. It is an issue, but what we need to do, and this is what, what the conversation is about. You can't grant amnesty. You can't grant this path to citizenship. Okay, without fixing the, um, the the incentive, without taking away the bait that brings people across the border, and again, somebody in the United States is paying them because they're cheaper than American labor. Well, and you I'm know, sorry, if I, they're coming I, over I, here and they're working and they're being productive, um, I don't have a problem with that. Jobs that believe me. In the hippie days, I picked fruit on a on a Chautauqua with my brother in a Volkswagen van up and down California. It's not an easy job when it's 110 degrees outside. I don't want to do it. And now they have water, they have bathrooms, they, they have facilities. But even back in the 60s, not so much. Right. Hey, I, I never, I never knocked the fact that they were hard workers. That that was isn't the point. Especially the ones that are coming over here and want to be honest and and, and do a, a day's work for a day's wage. But we have a very large gang problem uh, with both uh, Hispanics and Asians that are you going do. on. You do. I mean, it goes it goes all the way into the prisons. And and yes. you know, I'll say the Mexican mafia is is an issue. Uh, I run into a, but we have a gang problem everywhere. Right. Uh, you, you had a gang problem at the central jail in L.A. because they realized that the sheriff's department had become a gang. The yeah. guards had become a gang, but only in, 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 believe me, I'm exposed to it on a daily basis. The gang thing, I just, I understand, but I just don't understand. Right. right. And, well, it's the need, know, the need to, to belong upset. to something. It's the need to belong to something. That's what, that's what they are. And then, and then... Do they want to go work at uh, picking fruit or work at a supermarket? No, it's easier to sell drugs on the street corner and make a thousand dollars a day than go make twenty dollars a day picking fruit. And as I said to you last night when we were kind of test driving this deal, and uh, you know I have to make this. I'm far from a racist, uh, but it, I, I say to my Hispanic students who are probably legal. Uh, in most cases, um, due to the 14th Amendment. I mean, you know, if uh, if you uh, 
if you came to this country after 1865, if your grandparents came to this country after 1865, whether they came up, whether they came over here uh, legally or illegally, the 14th Amendment made their children and their grandchildren and every generation thereafter an American citizen. Yes, it did. And it is a core tenet of our Constitution and the American way, which I think we, we, we have discussed, is changing, is not the American way it was even 50 years ago when right. we were a kid, um, that, that, you know, if you drop the baby here, it's an American citizen. Uh, so... And, you know, in the last election cycle uh, and, and previous to, there were some issues that we needed to look at the 14th Amendment. I think, too, it, and, and as much as it just hurts my American soul, we may have to look at, you know, if you, because we have to look at causation. Say so we need to find, you know, just by admitting 11 million people, that's not going to fix the problem. If anything, I mean, in 1989, when we gave them amnesty, we gave them a legal way into the society. Right. Right. But we didn't do anything about the motivation in them coming across the border. Right. right. Uh, it, it, and a real tearing issue for me is the 14th Amendment. Yeah. Uh, it is so much the fabric and the product of, of you know, the African-American slaves be, being freed uh, who didn't know what to do with their freedom when they were freed. Um, but it, it is so much the fabric of this country. Do you change that? And does this immigration issue right. cause you to change that? I mean, there, there was an article about uh, baby uh, uh, hotels, uh, people uh, you know renting houses and making 17 bedrooms so illegals sure. could come here and birth their child in the United States. Somebody is always going to scam the system. It's always going to happen, so that's not a surprise. So the issue is, do we have to look at the 14th Amendment? Is I, part of this look, yeah. look at how I, we treat our, our citizenship? I, I know, and it's going to sound funny for me, but I don't want to see it changed. I, I don't want to open up that box. Hey, and, it turns my guts up. I mean, it, it's it's part of this country that you yeah. know it is we we opened our door to everyone but sure. as the election as our previous election proved it has and i think you have to i think we would both agree on this it's fact uh some hundred and fifty years later is it has effectively changed our our, our our demographic right right but that's worldwide but uh the the there's always going to be this demographic switch. There's the ebb and flow. There's the, you know, as as Caucasians have less children and Hispanics have more, it's it's going to change, and it's just it's just the way it is. Um, well, my friends in Australia, I mean, at the end of the day, mate, it's a Muslim country. Yeah. They've lost the battle. The white Australian, and you, and, and for those that don't know, that Australia has the largest Greek population population outside of Greece. Uh, there are many ethnics of mine, Croatians, Slovenians, Herzegovinians, Serbians, Eastern Europeans, referred to by the white Aussie as wogs, uh, in Australia. Uh, and because Indonesia, and they do so much business with Indonesia, and cheap labor, much cheaper labor in Indonesia than in Australia, hmm. um, they're pop believe me, man, uh, they and, and, and it's had this transition, religious and ethnic, and the melding ethnically and the predominance of the, of the Muslim to the, to the Christian is going on throughout the world. It's not something isolated to us. They have a huge no. immigration problem in Europe. Yes. And it yes. would be Eastern European countries that have become part of the EU that says if you're you know, a member country, you can work in any country in the EU. Mm hmm but Britain doesn't want that. No, no. France doesn't want that. Well, but France has and its own series of problems with, with that. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that I try to bring up at, at school. Look, these problems that we're facing are not, you know, you poke your head up, go to the BBC, uh, maybe the new American or, you know, the Algera uh, news service, which is actually fairly objective, you... Uh, we as the United States need to begin to take a world view. Mm -hmm. And I think on the immigration issue, uh, 
that is also incumbent. We need this is pushing us taking a world view because we are part of the world. We we are doing that we have done and are doing some very isolationist kind of things. Rob, between you and me, why aren't we on the metric system? Why aren't we on the metric system? No. How come we're VHS we, and the worst rest of the well, world yeah. is PAP? Hey, you remember when we were in elementary school, uh, at that particular time, what was talk about bringing in the metric system. I remember that specifically hey, because it started bringing out the metric, tables. <laughs> Metrics in junior high school. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and of course, it didn't it didn't catch on. It isn't going to catch on. We're not not as long as long as us old farts are still around. It may change because it's has changed in the military, and most uh, other things are uh, most other groups are using metrics. So it is changing. But it was very interesting because uh, I remember specifically gradual, thinking in school that I was going to have to learn metrics now, <laughs> which oh, would have made was, life a lot yeah, easier. Really upsetting, and I think there are little things and. I mean, it's such a great country. We're, we're capable of doing this. But at the same time, we want to keep a certain level of exclusivity. Right. But, but you know, you can't buy a car that doesn't have a speedometer in, in both. Right. Right. Well, that yeah, it's because that car goes everywhere, right? Cars are worldwide now. So. Well, you can't make, when you are, are, are making cars for China and, you know, GM's making cars all over the world and you have a, you know, you have a, a, a subcontractor. You can't tell, no, 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 no. You have to make so many with just miles per hour. And England has assimilated. I mean, they use both. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, I, I've had an so opportunity I, to drive in Canada a few times, and I'm, I'm really glad that they had the metrics on the dial. <laughs> I, bought, I bought a BMW, a German BMW that was brought over from Germany. Yeah. So I had to very quickly understand that kilometers are 60% of a, of a mile. So when I'm doing 120, I'm doing 72 miles an hour. Right, right. I yeah, have to it, constantly it, just look at my speedo the, and take 60%. Well, it's good because you'd look down there and freak out thinking that you were going 120 miles an hour in, oh, in our I terms, had right? many a woman to go, ah, we're going 120 miles an hour. What's it he was doing? good for a hug, you know what I mean? But, hey, you uh, know, I, I, I've got to interrupt again. I still can't believe we don't have a caller. This is the first time we haven't had a caller. 621-1210. Somebody jump in on this because I'm about to change subjects. So well, we're talking and, about, you know, maybe maybe next week I'll uh, maybe we need a Chiron running the phone number down there. Well, right, right. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, we'll get it. We'll get it. It ha it happens. And I, sometimes it happens just because I didn't announce we what we're going to talk thank about. Anybody that's watching. And, 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 and well, yeah, if, please. If we're so doggone entertaining that they don't want to, you know. Well, what's nice? You know what? I, we're talking about transportation. So I've got a little bit that's just, just driving me crazy. And that's high, high speed rail. You know, and so I wrote up a little thing, and you know, I, despite the odds and opposition, hey, whoa, 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 stop, stop, we got a caller. Let's see who. Oh my god. Oh my god, we got to get this caller. Uh, or not? They hung up. We had a caller. We got excited, and they hung up. You hung up on him. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> It didn't Tell even. The phone is interrupted. It didn't. Come it on. didn't even register the caller the ID. Rail. All right. Well, Ready. thanks for ringing. Whoever that was, well, thanks for ringing. So anyway, with with high speed rail, it, it, it's one of the things that is driving me crazy because I don't know. I look at the cost, you know, and despite the odds in opposition, California will become the home of the nation's first truly high speed rail system. So in late July 2012, the governor of California decided to match the $3 billion of federal funds that were almost due to expire because the Fresno-Bakersfield line, that's because of them, the $6 billion 130-mile initial segment in the Central Valley will begin construction this summer. This will be a huge milestone in a decades-long effort to bring fast trains enjoyed all over the world to the United States. The problem with high-speed rail is that the net benefits don't come close to the costs. So, what do you think, John? How are we gonna How are we gonna justify spending that kind of money for our bullet train? Well, you know, but at the same time, uh, Lincoln, in, in the midst of looking at the Civil War, uh, was also dedicated to make sure that trains, that the track for trains ran from coast to coast. Uh, that was accomplished during his administration. The Eisenhower administration built, for national security reasons, we built the interstate highway system, yes. which at the time certainly did not 
the, the cost exceed far exceeded the benefit. But you also have to realize during the Eisenhower administration, the top tax bracket, the top tax dollar was taxed at 80 percent. Right. The right. money was there. Yeah. Though we had a smaller population. Um, that top, you know, the, the money was there to do that. You can imagine where I live in Bakersfield, high speed rail is not a popular thing. No. My no. issue, but my issue goes back to what you just said. You've been to Europe. I've been to Europe. I've been to Australia. Australia doesn't have high speed. They just have rail. Right. But they don't have popu their population is 10% of our population. Right. They have the population in California in the area of the United States. The, the needs are there. My issue is, and, and is that our air plane service has become so expensive and so monopolized. Um, it, it costs una fortuna grande, and they charge you for the bag, and they charge you for the, and yeah, they grope yeah. you to get onto the airplane. Um, we need to, I think, as a country, we need to invest in a high-speed rail, and make uh, national transportation competitive. It is a monopoly by airlines at this point. Either you, because the train now is not not very much viable. It's not so good. Well, it, uh, it, it cannot we, run we on its own. Amtrak to has to be subsidized to keep running. I mean, it just doesn't cover its bills. Well, true, but uh, it, it, if you know, I, I, I think you had. I, I'm not crazy. Nobody's going to use the highest speed rail between Fresno and Bakersfield. It's just not going to happen. Right. Uh, ultimately, that it's going to be from Los Angeles to San Francisco. That opens that up a little bit. Yeah, but you On can't get hand, you can't get over the grapevine. Uh, well, you can. Not with high speed rail. It's designed to run on flat they're ground. Gonna, they're going to bore through the mountain, or are they going to go through the Tehachapi Pass? Yeah, well, good luck with any of that. I mean, well, they, the you know. thing of it is that the issue of getting over the mountains is not an issue anymore. From the standpoint of it was just that it, it, if it's a mag lift train, it, we can run it right along the Interstate 10 if that's what we need to do. Or uh, Interstate Five, but it loses uh, its high speed. It just becomes go, rail at that point. It'll go. It'll go. You know, but we have the technology. The mountains mm. are not a not we've, a challenge. We've got rail already. What do you mean? We got rail between Los Angeles and San Francisco, and it all has to go through over the Tehachapi Loop. Yes, it's all right. Yes, it does. And now, when I was a kid, and my father was in Los Angeles, and we were in Fresno, I've been over on passenger trains to the Tehachapi Loop many times. But over time, it's it, it's it's just not it, it's not cost effective to at this point tie up the Tehachapi Loop, which is a wonderful thing, which I I go and visit almost annually, uh, living in Kern County, because uh, it's an amazing piece of engineering. Yeah. And you love you love to be able to take a picture of the train looking at itself yep. as it goes over the loop. It's and uh, and, and again, it was implementation of illegal immigrants. Chinese that built that, that built, <laughs> that built most of the rail system in California. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it was a, it's a, a history. The history of the rail itself, if you're a historian at all, the study of the history of the rail by itself will take you a lifetime to go through. It's very very interesting. And 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 it completely changing the subject. Um, you know, and I ruminated about this when we did election coverage, and I ruminated. And being a history teacher, um, you know, some kids love history. Some people love history and some mm -hmm. people don't. Right. But I think part of our national problem is, is that we are not looking at history. How did we get here? What were the processes that, that went, went on? Because if you look at history, hopefully you'll get some idea of how the United States of America became, became the greatest country on earth. Second yeah. to none. Yep. And if you look at history, you can see some of our some of the pieces of the chunks falling out that are kind of leading to what you and I talk about sometimes as our demise. Yeah. And in the election, there was very there was very little reverence or reference made to history. Um, and it is elegant. It is wonderful. You find out things that you 
that that just shock you. Yeah, yeah. History is wonderful. There, you know what? And sometimes for the younger kids out there, there are some documentaries and there are some shows that might pique your interest a little bit about the history of the United States. One of them that I've been watching recently is called Hell on Wheels, and that is the history of the building of the railroad system and what took place. And, and, and the conditions these guys worked in, and uh, very good place that's a jump off point. That's not an end all as far as the history of it goes, but it's very interesting. And, and if we can get the kids interested on some of these wonderfully made documentaries and shows, I think, uh, I, like you, John, I've been a history buff my whole life, and I, there's so much out there that you're missing. If you don't spend the time to read a little bit about the history of the country, you're just missing a wonderful story. And as weird as it sounds, Pawn Stars. Yes. Uh, counting Cars. All of these shows where they f they go to an expert to find out what is this. Right. They are adding history in that we, I mean, you know, you know uh, volumes about guns, but watching Pawn Stars and, and having them, well, I got to have my guy come in and look at this gun. Right. Uh, <laughs> and then you find out, well, this gun, you know, or that, that mm. or that, what was it, the, the French pistol that was an over and under uh, uh, um, a round on top and a shotgun on the bottom yep. that mm -hmm. was uh, that was commissioned by the Confederacy during the Civil War. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It, it, so it, it, we've lost some of our doc documentary co co connection, but some of these cable shows do bring the history factor in. You know, yes. the guy at the Las Vegas Museum, right? Who doesn't give a price? He just verifies whether it is or this isn't. This is what it is or, not. or whether it's rare. Or not. Yeah. 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 I want to, as a matter of fact, my, <clears throat> if I make another trip out to Las Vegas, I want to go to a couple of the museums there. His is one of them. And also the, uh, the, uh, uh, atomic bomb museum is there. It's supposed to be oh, yeah, really yeah, 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 yeah. fascinating. No, it's very cool. It's yeah. Very cool. I haven't had a chance to go to see that. So that, you know, the heck with the strip, I could care less, but you know, they, the museum the would be thing, great. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give this as a suggestion to people on the travel channel there, uh, there is a program called Mysteries at the Museum. Ah, yes. And there are little just gems of history. And what they do is it could be some, some little, I mean, one of them was some little museum here in the San Joaquin Valley that at deposited there is this artifact that leads to this wonderful story uh, of, of the historical story in California. Um, so, uh, you know, and uh, parents out there, uh, uh, I, 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 I wax poetic, but I think that Rob would agree. When we were kids, <clears throat> I, I, I'm only guessing your parents, but my parents took us to museums. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Or you, you went to the missions. You found, you know, uh, yeah, and, and, and God rest his soul, uh, Huell Hauser uh, did that for the state of California. Yeah, he did. He did. He really he went did. And found the uh, the obscurities, and uh, it, both coming from the Los Angeles area, a guy on C, uh, what was uh, KNX, which is now KCBS, um, Ralph Story, that did a program called Ralph Stories yeah. Los Angeles. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. history is really and neat. I got I into mean. the minutia. Yeah. But you found out, you know, that our hometown, Santa Monica, could have been the port city for Los Angeles. Wouldn't that have been some? Kind of glad it wasn't. And that's why those railroad tracks ran down Colorado <laughs> used to run off to the end of the pier. That's right. Yeah, there are plenty of pictures of that. Hey, John, we're winding up. We're down to the very last minute of the show. Uh, really sorry nobody decided to call in and join in. Maybe our topics weren't uh, controversial enough, but I thought we had some pretty good discussions. Uh, well, we'll get we'll, we'll get into Drone Gate and it, uh, that story will develop by next week. I'm sure that'll oh, be yeah. on our plate. Drone Gate will go. And as I uh, said, Go ahead. Said to people on my pitch, you and I are going to keep doing this until either nobody shows up or somebody does show up. There you go. Somebody will. We're, we're having a great time. We hope it's a, a bit entertaining. The show will be available on our site. It's a, it's a long view if you wish to view it, but it's going to be there as an archive, so you'll be able to watch that as well. And, John, I want to thank you very much for joining me, and thanks for everybody coming to OGT Studios. And this is Rob Charney with Old Guy Tech TV. Have a good evening, and thank you for joining us. They will support you, they will do referrals between clients. Um, you can't ask for a more complete marketing package. We love
of the windfall! And you can too. Think advertising with the windfall couldn't get any better? Well, it just did. For only $125 for a 30 second commercial filmed by Old Guy Tech TV, you can be seen and heard.